let me forget to do so. It is just good to be here today, and uh, I appreciate that. I'm feeling uh, very emotional today uh, for whatever reason, which I'm an emotional person to begin with. I mean, uh, I can watch Lassie save Timothy from the well for the hundredth time and still shed a tear. And so, uh, but feeling very emotional today. Boy, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm a child of the King. And I tell you, with what we've been through as of late and, and things in our country and other, other things, uh, I, I got to thinking about the, the, the emotional stages that I've gone through. And uh, I've gone from being just completely consumed with everything that was going on to literally it just consumed my life, uh, listening to it reading about it, all these things with the government, with the elections, with the, uh, the COVID, with all these things just consumed with everything. And if you're not careful, when you're too consumed, as I was, uh, you can almost become scared. Then you leave scared and I go to worried about everything. But then you go to just being concerned. It's okay to be concerned, amen? I'm concerned about the welfare of our country. I'm concerned about the welfare of our, our children and our grandchildren, my grandchildren. I'm concerned about all those things, and that's okay. But I don't worry anymore. I'm not scared anymore. And I'm, not, I'm not consumed anymore. Why? The choir just sang it. Because he lives. Because he lives. The second song, I will rise. Amen? And it's all written down in, God, in words of God if you let it speak to your heart. Amen? The Word of God. I told them Wednesday night, and we'll get to the message in a moment. It's been a very a hard week to prepare for the message. I told Brother Dean Wednesday night, uh, as I tried to tell him ahead of time, what I was going to preach on this morning. And then, of course, he knows me. He always walks into my office on Sunday morning. He did so this morning. And I said, not going to preach on that. And I come up here yesterday morning for a couple hours searching, asking God to give me the message he'd have me to preach. After spending a couple hours up here, the ladies were in the back working. And uh, I finally said, I'm going home. I don't know what we're going to preach, but I'm t I, I can't just read and read and read into something. I'm going home till God tells me something. Came in this morning, actually on my way to church this morning, about, and I got here at 5.30 or quarter to six, something like that. I was on the road. I remember looking at the clock on my truck, and I was just a mile or so away, and it said 5.30, exactly. And, but what got me was I was looking up at the sky, and I was looking at the, the beautiful sky. It was clear as it could be. The stars were, were shining, just perfectly clear, no clouds. Uh, the moon was just barely showing just a little sliver of the moon. And it's like God spoke to me. And he said, I'm in control of the stars and the moon, the earth, the tides going in and out, and all that's going on in this world. Do you not think I can take care of the problems that are facing you and your life in your country right now? It's just like then, just a peace falls over you, knowing God's in control of everything. Amen. God is in control of everything. I'm going to try to preach this morning. I did a little reading this morning, read some articles, some different things that have led me in this direction. Uh, a, a passage of scripture that is very, very familiar. Maybe look at it in just a little different mindset this morning. But uh, I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is one of the most familiar verses in the Bible. We're going to start, and I'm going to read 11 through 14 here in just a moment. But while you're reading there, and I've preached off this set of scriptures before, and, and as many preachers have, and it seems like we do turn to them uh, many times during a time where our nation might be facing uh, troubles or problems, and we need a nation to come together in prayer. No doubt at 9 11, the scripture was mentioned many, many times. Uh, it's been mentioned many, many times since. And we've used it, and we use chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, we tend to look at it as a prayer, or we tend to look at it as a pattern for prayer. But we sort of have to pull it out of context to do that very thing. Because if you will read in 2 Chronicles, you were to back up to chapter 6, I believe it's around verse number 12, Solomon begins his prayer. He is praying at the dedication of the temple, and he is praying to God. And actually what we're reading here, and the words that I will read you in a moment, uh, is actually God's answer to the prayer. So 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is not a prayer 
I will say it's a good pattern for prayer, but it is actually God's answer, God's response to Solomon's prayer. But we need to remember that. Because to bring it out any other way is to bring it out of context. So I want us to see today how, how God is responding to Solomon's prayer as he's dedicating the temple. And then I do want to use 7 and 14 as a, uh, as a jumping place. And I'm not sure exactly how we're going to end up today. I've jotted down several notes. Uh, we'll see how far those go or, or what happens from there. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to tell you what I told the church. Uh, I don't know if I believe it was Wednesday night. There's so much uncertainty in our world right now. So much uncertainty in our country. Uncertainty within our state. Which brings uncertainty all the way down into our homes, with our jobs, uh, with our children. We have so much uncertainty. However, with all the uncertainty, there's a couple things we know. I told the church Wednesday night, uh, I do not... Uh, pretend to nor can anyone else say that they understand and know the will of God uh, or not the will of God that's not the way I want to say this but know God's plan that is going on through all this the Bible said all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord called according to his purpose and that hadn't changed that's still true But I told them Wednesday night, what I do know is the beginning of God's plan, and I know the ending of God's plan. The beginning, it's God's will that all men should be saved. Amen? And then at the end, it's to take his church home to be with him for eternity. I know those two things to be a fact. All the things that are happening in between... I don't know, but by faith I accept those and believe that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord, called according to his purpose. It does not say all things are good. It doesn't mean that our walk is going to be easy all the time. It doesn't mean that we're not going to face hard times and trials and tribulations in this world, in this life where we do not belong. We are pilgrims in a foreign land. What it does mean is one day we're going to be victorious. We're going home to be with Jesus. Amen? That's what it means. But while we're in this section in the middle, and how close to the end we are, I don't know. People ask me that all the time. Preacher, is this it? Is this it? Is the Lord coming? Is this it? Yeah, he's coming. I don't know if it's today. I don't know if it's tomorrow. I don't know if it's next week or next year. But I know he's coming because I take him at his word. Amen? A God that cannot lie. So I don't know, but I do know he's coming. But while we're in this uh, period of time, Between where God wants all men to be saved and taking his church home, the born again bought by believers, taking them home to be with him for all of eternity. While we're in this middle section and there's much we don't know, there are some things we do know that we should do. We're here for a reason. Amen? The church is still here for a reason. The church is and has always been expected To work for Christ. Always. Amen. Absolutely always. I don't know who keeps stealing my Kleenex up here. There's some right here on the front row. Dean brought me a brand new box a week ago and it's gone. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. This weather makes my nose want to run. I'm sorry. See, that's terrible to say, especially when you're online. I know. It probably won't be the last thing I say. Amen. So 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, I want to read to you God's response to to Solomon's prayer. And yet I do believe that there is a a, a great pattern there for you and I that I want to look at. Because if our nation, and I'm going to talk more about this when we get into the message. But if our nation is going to prosper, if our nation is going to continue like like, like it has... In the past, if our nation is going to uh, continue to be a great nation under God, then we need to make some right turns. Amen? We need to make some right turns. Right turns. That's what we're going to preach on. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11 through 14, the Bible says this. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, 
I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, or if COVID comes into the United States, or if a, if a president is elected that you don't like. Amen? Let me add that right there. Then verse 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege to be here this morning, Lord. I thank you for every home that is here and represented within the pews of our church. Lord, we know we have many that are tuned in online this morning, and they are listening, Lord. And and whether we're here or whether they're at home or wherever they may be Lord we simply need help from you we need strength we need encouragement to fight another day Lord we need you to help us to push forward in this world and we look for that glorious appearing one day when you will step out on a cloud of glory and call your children home and then our days will be over our troubles will be over our health issues will be behind us Lord and we'll just be with you for all of eternity uh, Lord we look forward to that day we work till that day and Lord we just pray that you'd encourage us and strengthen us until that day occurs Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So I want to preach on that thought. If our nation is going to survive, if our nation is going to prosper, if our nation is going to continue uh, in the ways that our forefathers set it up on the Word of God, uh, then we must make some right turns. Amen? We must make some right turns. Now, in the text that I just read to you, uh, I understand the word turn, T-U-R-N. The word turn is only used one time. However, I believe if we'll read that a little closer, if we'll look at it, I believe that we can insert that word turn in there and come up with at least four uh, U-turns, four hairpin turns uh, that not only the church but our country need to make. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, you know me, and I've stood in this pulpit many days, and I've preached on prayer. I'm a firm believer in prayer. I have preached on the power of prayer. I have preached on the purpose of prayer. I've preached on the place of prayer. I've preached on the people of prayer. I believe in the power of prayer when we're speaking to a holy God. Amen? Amen. How many of us at some point in time in our lives, uh, I just had this conversation and probably shouldn't mention this, uh, but I just had this conversation and probably not done with it yet, uh, where my wife's Sirius XM radio uh, has come up to be renewed. Now she listens to her radio, absolutely, let me back up, she works two miles from home, okay? That's, not, that's, that's hardly a good song. But then she talks to her mother during that two miles. So I'm paying for Sirius XM radio for a two-mile trip one way, two-mile trip back the other way that she spends on the phone. But I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Until they sent me the cost. And I said, I'm not paying that, so I call them up. I'm going, I just got a point with it. I call them up. I'm not paying that. You know what I paid last year, that's what I'll pay this year. Well, sir, I can't do that. I said, ma'am, I am not going to spend an hour on this phone arguing with you. So just give me someone with more power than you have. That's my point. When I'm going to talk with somebody, I want somebody with the most power that I can get to. And that's exactly what we do when we pray. We go to the one with the most power that they could possibly be. And we make our petitions known. I don't, I'm not going to waste, I told her, I said, I'm not going to argue with you 30, 45 minutes. I don't want to do that. I never, ever raise my voice or yell at a lady on the phone. I've been mad enough to raise my voice on the phone, and I have said, please put a man on the phone. I have no problem yelling at a man sometimes, but a woman I will not yell at. So I'll say, please put a man on the phone. And then they know they've got me. So anyway, so I've preached on prayer. I believe in prayer. Here's the key to prayer. Prayer should be as natural to me and you. It should be as natural to a child of God as swimming is to a fish. Amen? 
Uh, it shouldn't be something that, now that we have to learn how to pray in God's will, yes. But just to pray, that should come as natural to the child of God as swimming is to a fish. In other words, when you're born again and placed into the family of God, uh, it should become a natural thing for you to call out to God your Father in prayer. Amen? Don't go to sleep yet. I'm just getting started. Amen. We got at least four right turns we're about to take. We ain't took one yet, so hang on. These are hairpin turns. So our nation, let me say this, that our nation that we love so dearly, and let me start out by saying I love America. Amen. Amen. I am glad I live in the United States. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else in this world. I am thankful that I was born in the United States. And above that, as I've said before, I'm thankful I was born in the Bible Belt of the United States where there's more gospel preaching than anywhere else in the world. I'm thankful for where God put me at. However, our very nation exists because of the, uh, the, the bravery and the prayers of people that were tired of being oppressed and were looking to be able to worship their God freely and they cried out to a holy God and that's the reason our very nation exists. And let me go one step further and tell you that the only reason our nation is still here and our nation continues to flourish is not because of the laws that have been legislated in the government but it's because of the prayers of the saints of God. Amen? I'll promise you this, church. The prayers of God's people carry much more weight than any law that's ever been passed. Prayer. So we're going to talk about prayer. That'll be one of our turns here in just a moment. So as I said, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to end up this morning, but we are going to go till we get done and be thankful for it. Amen? So, as I said, I thought to myself, if God can control the sun, the moon, the stars, and all that's going on, He can surely control the affairs of men. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, And He changeth the tithes uh, and the seasons. He removes kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So if we believe that and we understand that and we, and we truly believe that, then we couldn't put it any more eloquently than the songwriter already did uh, when he said, what if I to dread, what if I to fear leaning on the everlasting arms? Amen? So why do we spend time losing sleep, staying upset, uh, causing ourselves ulcers, uh, getting excited about everything when we know God is in control? I believe that. So let's take a turn. Turn one on this very curvy road we're about to get on. Full of hairpin turns. Turn one. Let's go back to our text in the 14th verse of uh, the 7th chapter of 2 Corinthians. He says here, if my people, which are called by my name. Turn number one should be a turn to God's glory. For our country and our church. There are two things I want to give you here that we need to remember. I want you to listen to them closely. Number one, our country our church, and us alone. We exist by and only by God's grace. Amen? We are a country here and we exist only by the grace of God. The Bible says in Acts 17 and 20, uh, uh, 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Romans 13, 1. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Our country now enjoys the freedoms that we have because they have been given to us by grace through our Creator, God Almighty Himself. Amen? Uh, we only exist today because of God's grace. And when God takes His hand off of our country, when God removes Himself from our country, or we ask God to leave our country, then just like many nations before us, we're going to fall. I looked this morning, I read that the average length of any dynasty, of any governmental dynasty, the average length is 250 years. If we make it to July 4th, our country will be 245 years old. We're on the cusp of that. And if we go in the direction that many would like to see us go, away from God, toward socialism, toward communism, we're going to see our nation fail like many before. Amen? 
But if we go down, we're going to go down praying and we're going to go down fighting. Amen? So we exist only by God's grace and we exist only for God's glory. The Bible said in Psalms 115 and 1, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Now listen, I think, and I told Brother Dean this earlier this morning, I think that America in general, I think that many people in general and even many churches, have. we are so blessed. We have been so greatly blessed by God that now we are under the impression uh, that we exist for God to bless us. Let me say something. That is just backwards. We exist so we can bless God. We exist because God allows us to exist, and we're not here uh, for for our glory, or we're not here rather for our glory to be shown to God, but for praying for God's glory to be given to us. We are a people that need God, and God has so richly poured out His blessings upon our country uh, that we've let it instead of pulling us closer to God, it's pushed us away from God. To many think, let me, many think that if you're American. You're special. The Bible tells me God is no respecter of persons. God loves me no more than he loves anybody else in any other country. Now, I'm thankful I'm American. And I'm not ashamed to be American. And and I'm glad to be American. And I'm glad to uh, partake of the blessings that come with being American. But God could very easily take those blessings away. It's not because I deserve that more than anybody else. Our nation has been blessed by God because it was founded upon God's word, God's principles, and we've always stood behind the nation of Israel. And when we stop those two things, you can expect to see the hand of God come off our nation. Amen. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. So, turn number one, we've got to turn to God's glory. Turn number two, hold on, put on your seatbelts. We've got to turn to God in prayer, as the Bible says here. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Pray. I'm going to give you two thoughts on prayer. Two what I think are staggering, amazing uh, thoughts here, facts. Number one, that when we pray, God listens. You say, I know that, but I want you to think about that a moment. I want you to dwell on that just a moment. The same God that stepped out on nothing, with nothing, and spoke this world into existence. The same God that took clay and created man and and spoke a living soul into him. Breathed a living soul into him. The same God that sent the flood, destroyed the world, and repopulated it again. The same God that created everything you see and everything you are. That same God listens to little old me when I pray. When I kneel at this altar, kneel anywhere else in this world, and I say, Lord, his ears tune my way. He loves me enough and he cares me enough that he'll hear my prayer. And he'll hear me call out his name. And he'll hear me lift up the petitions of God, uh, the petitions that people have given me. And not only does he hear me and listen to me, but he answers my prayers. You say, is everything you pray answered? Yes. 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 Really? Yes. God answers either yes, no, or wait a little while. But he answers every one of them. He doesn't let me just talk to be talking. Because, see, sometimes I don't know what's best for myself. And God has to say, no, no. Robert, you think you want that? And you think that's right? And you think that's what I should do? But I know tomorrow. And I know next week. And I know what the future holds for you and your family and your church. So, no, Robert, that wouldn't be good for you. Okay, God, you know what's best. Faith, we believe that, amen? So we, the fact, one astonishing fact is that God listens to us. Then here's the sad fact. We know that God hears our prayers. We know that God answers our prayers. I looked up some statistics, and I didn't bring them out here with me. But it's a very, very short period of time that the average Christian spends in prayer 
The sad fact is we don't utilize prayer. Notice I use the word we there. So I'm not casting stones. Not at you. Unless I'm casting at me also. We don't utilize prayer. We don't pray as much as we should and could as a whole. Amen? And if you say, preacher, I do, then, then I'm not speaking to you. I'm saying as a whole. And I, I should have wrote those down and brought them out. But they were disheartening uh, to the... To the the percentage of Christians that actually pray, one other thing was most Christians only pray one day a week. And, and that's pr probably trying to get out of the house on Sunday morning. Lord, would you please make this kid hushed where I can get out of the house and get to church on time. And there's their prayer life for the week. I don't know. But it just most of them, they said pray just one day a week. And the, and the time they spent in prayer, was it was all over the place. So that's the reason I didn't bring that out. But I do know this, we don't pray as much as we should or could and if we know that God hears we know that he answers and we know that's what we need to do to straighten this mess out why do we not why do we not so we need to turn to God in prayer we need to pray for strength for healing for our nation for our families for our friends pray for encouragement it's okay to pray for yourself I had have people come to me and ask me would you pray for me preacher because I don't think it's right for me to pray for myself that's selfish if that's selfish, I'm very selfish because I do pray for myself. And I pray for my family and I pray for my church. But I pray for myself also. God, I, I need your forgiveness. I need to be in your will. I need your strength. I, I need your direction. Lord, I need all these things from you. Why would I not pray? The greatest man to ever walk the face of the earth, to ever step foot on this earth, was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God. And yet he felt it was necessary and needful to pray I wrote down just three or four quick things here and I'll give them to you quick if you want them later I can give them to you but Jesus he prayed for refreshing times and strengthening times and and he'd get away by himself and he did so in Luke 5 and 16 he left the multitudes that were pressing him to heal for healing and for miracles and he left them to be alone with God sometimes you just need to be alone amen alone he also prayed, Jesus did in Luke 6 and 12, he prayed before making any large decisions. In Luke 6 and 12, he was praying, he spent the night in prayer before he called out his disciples. If Jesus did this, should you and I not? Before we buy a car, purchase a home, before we do any of these things, how much better would our life be if we spent time in prayer and then we listened? Now listen, when you're on your way to the car lot to sign the papers and you say, Lord, is this the right thing I'm doing it anyway? Bless it. That's not really praying about it, amen? Bless it if you can, Lord, but I don't make my mind. I mean, they're holding it for me. I put down deposit. I got to go and get it. It's too late, so I need you to bless this. That's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. So in times of decision, in times of distress, Jesus prayed in Matthew 26, 39, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me in the Garden of Gethsemane. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In Luke 23 and 46, while hanging on the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This is the Lamb of God praying in times of distress and heartache. He also prayed for the faith of his disciples in Luke 22 and 32. He prayed for them to be strengthened in the work of God. We need to do the same. So turn number two is we need to turn back to prayer. Turn number three, and I'm trying to hurry. Turn number three is we need to turn to God's word. The Bible says here in our text, and seek my face. To seek God's face means to seek his will. You can only find God's will if you're looking in God's word. Did you catch that? To seek God's face is to seek God's will. You can only find God's will if you're looking in God's word. You're not going to find God's will in the New York Times or any other publication or a magazine or on Facebook or anywhere else. You're going to find God's will for your life in the word of God. In the Word of God. So, I'm going to read a story here that I read this morning. It'll take me just a minute, so bear with me. I did not fact check every bit of this story, but it came from the book, The Tale of the Tardy Ox Cart by Charles Swindoll. I'm assuming he fact checked it. I would say he did. And so I'm going to read it to you. Most of us have heard the story of the mutiny on the bounty. I'm talking about God's Word, turning to God's Word. Keep that in mind while I read this story. But a few of us have heard how the Bible played. This is verbatim, verbatim out of his book. 
Few of us have heard how the Bible played a very vital part in the historical event. The Bounty was a British ship which set sail from England in 1787, bound for the South Seas. The idea was that those on board would spend some time among the islands, transplanting fruit-bearing plants and fruit-bearing trees and doing other things to make some of the islands more habitable. After 10 months of voyage, the Bounty arrived safely at its destination. And for six months, the officers and the crew gave themselves to the duties placed upon them by their government. When the special task was completed, however, and the order came to embark again, the sailors rebelled. They had formed strong attachments for the native girls, and the climate and the ease of the South Sea island life was much to their liking. The result was mutiny on the bounty, and the sailors placed Captain Bly and a few loyal men adrift in an open boat. Captain Bly, in almost miraculous fashion, survived the ordeal, was rescued, and eventually arrived home in London to tell his story. An expedition was launched to punish the mutineers. And in due time, 14 of them were captured and paid the penalty under British law. But nine of the men had gone to another distant island. There they formed a colony. Perhaps there has never been a more degraded and debauched social life than that of that colony. They learned to distill whiskey from a native plant. And the whiskey, as usual, along with the other habits, led to their ruin, disease, And murder took the lives, listen, of all the native men and of all but one of the white men named Alexander Smith. His name was also John Adams, but he went by Alexander Smith. He found himself the only man on an island surrounded by a crowd of women. Alexander Smith, or John Adams, found a Bible among the possessions of a dead sailor. The book was new to him. He had never read it before. He sat down and read it through. He believed it and he began to appropriate it. He wanted others to share in the benefits of this book, so he taught classes to the women and the children. And as he read to them and taught them the scriptures, it was 20 years before a ship ever found that island. And when it did, a miniature utopia was discovered. The people were living in decency, prosperity, harmony, and peace. There was nothing of crime disease, immorality, insanity, or illiteracy. How was it accomplished? By the reading, the believing, and the appropriating of the truth of God. Amen? So we as a nation need to take a turn, not away from, but back to God's Word. And I do believe I believe with all my heart, mind, and soul that right now, even within uh, parts of our government, there is a direct assault uh, coming out towards the church and conservatism, which should go hand in hand. There is a direct assault coming upon the church. And if our nation does not turn back to the Word of God, then we're going to destroy ourselves from the inside out. I forget what year it was, 1967, 69 or something. Gorbachev said himself that we'll take over America and we'll have communism in America and we'll never fire a single shot. We're seeing the words of that prophecy come to pass from Gorbachev this day. So we need to pray and we need to pray that our country would turn back to the Word of God. It's our only hope, the Word of God. Last turn, turn four. We need to turn to God in repentance. The Bible said, and turn from their wicked ways. If our nation ever repents, the repentance will have to begin with God's people. God's people. Most of us have heard of, a, of the great preacher Jonathan Edwards of the Great Awakening Time in the early 1700s. In the book, uh, Holiness by Grace by Brian Chapel, he said this. That Jonathan Edwards was presiding over a massive prayer meeting. 800 men were praying with him. In that meeting, or into the meeting, a woman sent a message asking the men to pray for her husband. The note said this. It described a man who had become unloving, prideful, and difficult. Edwards read the message in private. And then thinking that perhaps the man described was present, he made a bold request. He stood before the 800 men and he read the note to the 800 men. He read a note that said, my husband has become unloving, 
prideful and difficult. And then he asked if the man who had been described would wait, raise his hand so the whole assembly could pray for him. He said 300 men raised their hands. That's where we've got today. We've got prideful, almost unloving. We've got difficult in the things of God. Our churches are not operating, I don't believe, as God would want them to. We're getting away from the, from the truths of the Word of God. We're allowing the world into our churches and into our homes at an alarming rate that are causing us not to seek the Word of God and, and not to repent of the sins of our lives, our homes, our families, and our churches. 300 men realized that that was describing them. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it started with God's people and it swept across America that we'd begin to repent of who we've become and turn back to the living God? Billy Graham made this statement. I'm almost done. Billy Graham once said that men were not called to be successful, but rather to be faithful. That is a tremendous quote. Men were not called to be successful, but rather to be faithful. Faithful. If our nation is going to turn back to God, it will be, it'll start rather, through faithful men and women. Now I've said all that, and there's some sitting here today that would just say, Preacher, we're just a small Baptist church sitting on the side of Highway 152 in Mooresville, North Carolina. What could we possibly do to save our nation? What could we possibly do at our church to save our nation? I'm going to give you a great example. And I'm going to go through this real quick. How God took one faithful man, one man, and saved his family and saved a nation. One man. And you can go home and read it if you've got time. And you can start the 37th chapter of the book of Genesis. And you can read through the 50th chapter, the last chapter. And it's going to tell you the story of young Joseph. And I'm going to give you a very quick overview in closing. When Joseph was 17 years old in Genesis 37 2, he was sold into slavery to the Midianites by his brothers because his brothers despised him because Joseph told him he had a dream and his brothers and his father would bow down to him. They despised him. They hated him. They sold him into slavery to the Midianites. The Midianites then sold him into slavery to the officer in Pharaoh of Egypt. And you know that was Potiphar. You know then Potiphar's wife sought Joseph for his good looks and she was after Joseph and she falsely accused Joseph of trying to seduce her. And Joseph was cast into prison in, in Genesis 39. While he was in prison in Genesis 40, Joseph correctly interprets the dreams of Pharaoh's uh, uh, two uh, people, or two, one cupbearer and one baker, I should say, been thrown into prison. The cupbearer was restored to his position just as Joseph predicted. Two years more passes by with Joseph in prison. You think we're going through hard times. Joseph's still in prison. Two more years pass by. Pharaoh has a dream. They call on Joseph to interpret his dream. And because of what Joseph tells him in Genesis 41, then Pharaoh makes Joseph, here's Joseph, 17 years old, hated by his family, cast into slavery, cast into prison. And now... God's going to bring him to second in command of all Egypt. Now think about that. Second in command of all Egypt. And he was to be over the grain, disp the grain disbursement. And, and to collect the grain through the seven years of plenty. Knowing seven years of famine was coming. During that famine, Joseph was 30 years old at that point in time. And during that time, we don't know exactly when during the famine, but the famine, famine got worse. And Joseph's family comes, his brothers. And they stand before Joseph, not knowing who Joseph was. But he recognized them. And so God used that young man. And at 30 years old, then he comes. And he sends grain home. And he sustained his family. He saved his family. And not only that, he saved an entire nation. All because he was faithful. Not just when he's on the mountaintop. But he was faithful in the prison. He was faithful when he was a slave. Joseph was faithful to his God. So what can we do as a hundred people, 
120 people. What can we do as West Corinth Baptist Church if God could use one man that was faithful to save his family and save a nation? Do you not think God could start by with this church to save our nation? I believe so. But I believe we must be faithful. We must turn to God. We must turn to prayer. We must repent. We must turn to God's Word. And if we will make those turns, then I truly believe that we can save our nation for our children and our grandchildren. Listen, I'm 56 years old. I don't know how much longer I'll live. I don't know. I don't expect to be 90 years old. I truthfully don't expect to make it to 80. If I make it to 70, I'm going to feel like a very blessed man. But whenever God chooses to take me, I said that to say this. I'll probably be gone before most of this stuff comes into pass. But I want my nation to still have the same opportunities that it afforded me for my grandchildren. And their children, if time stands. However, when I pray, I end my prayer just like in Revelation. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here today. We thank you for every home that's here and represented. We hope, Lord, that the words that we've spoken today will bring hope and encouragement and strength. Lord, we pray that they would direct us. And that, Lord, we would become even more faithful. That we would turn to you. Turn in prayer. Lord, we would turn to your word and we would turn in repentance. Lord, if we will make these necessary turns as a people of God, then our nation can still survive and be the great nation and serve you, share the gospel around the world, stand behind Israel. Lord, if we'll continue to do these things and keep the hand of God upon our nation, Lord, we'd just be so grateful, so thankful. Lord, once again, we thank you, we love you. Save that one closest to hell in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Got a few things I uh, want to tell you real quick. It won't take but a moment, and then we'll take up our offering after the fact. 